Every year that I do this series, a few of you complain that I waste my time by not watching any, quote, real movies. Now, as I've stated in the past, I watch what I want to watch, and I'm always looking for that hidden gem, stuff like Chopping Mall and The Majorettes. That's the real joy of doing this every year. Now, that doesn't mean I don't watch your real movies, though. The problem with doing real movies is that YouTube will slap a copyright violation on me instantly, and so anything creative I try to do with one will just go unseen. So this year, I'm going to offer you a compromise. I will talk about your real movies this season, but in exchange for not being able to use video, I'll give you twice the reviews. Deal? Good. Having watched Piranha, Piranha 2 twice, and that what-the-hell 90s remake of Piranha in previous seasons, I found it only fitting to check out the 2010 version, a very, very loose remake of Joe Dante's great 70s flick. And it won points with me right away as Richard Dreyfuss appears in the cold open, essentially getting the Drew Barrymore scream treatment, and the film does everything it can to make you think that this is the same character he played in Jaws. It's a nice touch, and so kudos to you right off the bat, movie. The film becomes your standard small-town spring break gone wrong thanks to the release of countless prehistoric piranha fish tale, with Elizabeth Shue as the town sheriff trying to keep the peace. Now, as you might expect, there are a lot of skimpy bathing suits and, well, full-blown nudity in Piranha to fill up the time between the fish kills. Yet another reason why making a video for this would have been damn near impossible. And you know me, I love looking at boobs, but this movie starts to make you feel almost creepy for doing that, and I hate when that happens. Christopher Lloyd shows up at one point as a fish expert, and before I even had the chance to finish the thought, man, I hope he starts Doc Browning, he was immediately in full-blown Doc Brown mode. So, more points for you, movie. Jerry O'Connell is in this, essentially playing Joe Francis, the total douchebag behind the otherwise genius Girls Gone Wild franchise, and not surprisingly plays him as a total douchebag. Some people found this character annoying, but I think it works perfectly here. And that's not something I often say about Jerry O'Connell. One minor complaint is that it kind of wallows in its violence a bit too much. Seeing one guy get pulled apart while people are trying to pull him out of the water is fine, but man, this movie goes just full tilt crazy at one point with the violence, and there's a good ten minutes or so where just hundreds of people are getting massacred. It's amusing and interesting to a point, but then it hits that wall and sadly keeps going. And going. The most glaring flaw of the film, though, are the 3D special effects, which look like complete garbage in regular 2D. And that's a shame, because otherwise it's a very capable genre film. I hate that it sacrificed decent effects for the cheap bump from the fad of 3D, because in the long run it's just going to hurt it even more. This is why I love sticking to movies from the 70s and the 80s. But despite all that, I still recommend Piranha. It's a solid three-star film. Now, when I first heard that they were remaking John Carpenter's The Thing, I was somewhat enraged, as the 1982 version is probably in my top three horror movies of all time. Then when I heard it was going to be a prequel, focusing on the Norwegian crew who initially find the alien, my interest peaked. But now that I've seen it, all I can muster is a... meh. Now, real quick, let me point out that I know John Carpenter's film is itself a remake, but the differences between the original and the 1982 film are drastic. Filmmaking in the sci-fi horror genre evolved so much from the 1950s to the 1980s, and now that genre has almost become stagnant. Here's the problem with doing a prequel within a finite timeline. If you're a fan of the 1982 film like I am, you already know all the details and outcome of this one. So basically, you're just watching with a checklist, waiting for that to go there, for this to end up over here, okay, that explains why that was that, etc. There's no sense of discovery or amazement. Now, coupled with that is that this crew essentially comes to all the same conclusions Kurt Russell and company do in the film we've already seen. So aside from one new way to determine who the thing is and who isn't, the progress of the story is essentially the same. Also, two Americans are brought in to help out, a component that I don't think was mentioned about this Norwegian crew in the 1982 film. This just feels like Hollywood pandering, because clearly no one would watch a film about a group of Norwegians getting murdered. Then, despite this connection we're supposed to feel for these new characters, no one in the film is developed in any way. There's the chick, there's the guy who was on Community, and everyone else. Carpenter's film had characters that were interesting and at least somewhat distinctive. And then, of course, there are the special effects. Supposedly, it was shot with mostly practical effects, which proved to be unconvincing, so they layered on a bunch of CGI, which made them look even more unconvincing. I know I sound like a broken record with this stuff, but still, as dated as the practical effects are in the 1982 version, they're still amazing to look at. Nothing here has that holy shit factor to it. 
By the time this one was wrapping up, I really wasn't even paying that much attention to it. Thankfully, like Indiana Jones 4 and Prometheus, I can just pretend it's something that doesn't exist.